we are live. So, well, welcome to 2008's Frost Nixon Review and Thoughts, film not play. Happy Pride! Let's appreciate that the current American president is nowhere near as terrible as Nixon the homophobe. Not to mention Trump. Oh, uh, crap, I just said not to mention him in the night. So, obviously, when someone reviews or discusses this movie in any way, you, the viewer, may wonder where that person is where the person doing the review stands on Nixon. I'll admit that this movie elicits, elicits some empathy and sympathy for him from me, but otherwise I loathe him. A war criminal who destroyed civil rights just because it would help him politically, not even because he necessarily believed in it, just because he wanted power and validation. Now, some people think that he basically, you know, did the best he could with the cards he was dealt. And I definitely want to say I know it's difficult to be like him because I have friends that had some of his character traits and they expressed that they sometimes find it frustrating. Some of my friends are defeatists who feel looked down upon, awkward in social environments, who are very lonely. So you might be wondering how I can be friends with them when they're so similar to Nixon. And the answer to that is very simple. They recognize that with those character flaws, they would not make good elected officials, so they don't run for office. Really, there's no shame in that. There are very, very few people who can be responsible with that kind of power. What is something people should feel shame over is if they are too selfish to acknowledge that they would not be able to be responsible with that kind of power. If Nixon had never taken political office, maybe the person who was president for those years would make much better decisions, and people who are now dead might have been alive still might still be alive. There we go. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies I watched, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. So I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. Certainly, if I do spoil anything, I'll verbally warn before I do so, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower the index finger. As soon as I end the review itself and get into the thought section, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, both, both for the film and the play, and I will be discussing the ending. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. I got this movie on sale, so I'm going to be negative to say this, it not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time, nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting, what other movies like it. I don't have some personal banana against anyone who worked on making it to the best of my ability. The negative things that I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out and what it was trying to achieve. Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, I've watched this movie somewhere between three and five times, and my first viewing was in 2010, and the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video so that it would be fresh in my mind. Now, the plot. It is the summer of 1977. David Frost, the TV personality, gets the chance to interview disgraced ex-president Richard Nixon. He wants to get him to confess on camera. Is he out of his depth? Now, this is a biography drama history movie from 2008, directed by Ron Howard, and basically the, you know, it's about confronting Nixon and how he betrayed the faith his voters put into him. Am I making this video to try to will into existence an on-camera confession by improper legal consequences for all the many, many illegal acts by Donald Trump? Possibly. And given when it came out, it's clearly meant to apply to Bush Jr. as well. It's it's wild to re like when you read reviews of this. Some people will be like, "Ah, oh, remember when we thought Nixon was as bad as it was going to get, and then we got Bush." And a lot of those people, <sighs> yeah, now Trump is even worse. <laughs> Trump was even worse. He's no longer president, and that is that is the thing I take tremendous relief in. Now, the I, I haven't watched the play that the movie is adapting, so let's see. But uh, yeah, I would definitely say this movie was well worth making. 
Now, this movie is primarily about characters more than the plot. I think that was the right choice. Some of what the movie depicts did not actually happen. I'm not sure it's that much more loose than your average based on a true story movie, but it definitely, there are some things that place fast and loose with. And it is very clearly, like, for those that that's going to bother, this is definitely a movie made by people who really, really did not like it. You know, who don't like Nixon. And yes, there are sadly times where it gets a little petty. I really wish it wouldn't. You don't You don't have to get petty with Nixon. He, he kind of dug his own grave. Now, the IMDb more like this list compares this to Good Night and Good Luck to Nixon, the, the Oliver Stone movie. Oh, I, I should briefly say. Good Night and Good Luck is an 8 out of 10 for me. Nixon is a 7 out of 10. I suppose technically the following could argue. No, no, it's not really a, a, a spoiler. Oliver Stone's Nixon is more focused on humanizing and understanding Nixon than this movie is. And that film suggests that Nixon was a complicated individual more so than this movie does. And it's also been compared to Oliver Stone's JFK, which I give an 8 out of 10, and Michael Clayton, which I'll give an 8 out of 10. Now, the reason I decided to review this is I think it is extremely important to hold accountable the powerful. And the reason I bought it in the first place is I'm passionate about U.S. politics. Now, this was written by Peter Morgan, who also wrote the play. I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with his other work. He, you know, he, he adapted his own stage play, but he's written other movies. It's not that they just got someone who only writes plays. The only thing, you know, he, he did rewrites on State of Play, so that's a movie I've watched. And he wrote the other, Bolin. It's been a while since I watched that movie. I forget the pronunciation. I'm going with Bolin. The other Bolin girl. Those are the only two movies he's written. You know, I'm, I hear good things about the Queen. The movie, not the individual. And let's see. So, Maggie Mae Fish, the tr tremendously talented YouTuber, released a video going into all the President's Men and Coup 53. And in it, she talked about that Nixon for his re-election focused on being as presentable for TV as possible. So basically, the whole Frost Nixon interview was basically Frost trying to, you know, force Nixon back out of the presentable shell he had carefully formed and become the truly despicable persona that everyone knew he actually was, and then shame him into confessing. Now, you know, Ron Howard, it's not the first time that he's fictionalized some events. He did the same thing with A Beautiful Mind. If you want to know a lot of what they changed here for the play and or show, the Wikipedia entry for the movie has a number of details. I will be commenting on some of the changes at the very start of the section entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. Now, this movie handles plot twists pretty well. There are not too many, they're not bad, and they're not too easy to figure out. And they're not difficult to keep up to keep up with the movie on. Now, the direction is quite focused. And, yeah, Ron Howard directs, I will just briefly go into the, the other movies I've watched that he's directed, are A Beautiful Mind, Ransom, Far and Away, Backdraft, Parenthood, Willow, and Splash. It really covers a lot of genres. No, I have not watched Apollo 13. Yes, I know, I should get to it. Now, he chose to work on this. It was, in fact, I believe it was his idea. He watched the play, and he was like, I want to make this into a movie, and you really, you can tell. His, his passion shines through. Now, it the movie builds tension rather well, and the drama is compelling, and I'm going to briefly quote from a few fellow critics. Yes, one says that Howard appears to attempt to give the film a sheen of phoniness. Yeah, kind of. A fellow, an, Another fellow critic says... <laughs> Okay, so this one I don't quite agree with, but I try to, you know, put out there differing viewpoints. It takes a nincompoop like Howard to imagine depth 
in this silliness. I wouldn't go quite that far. And let's see. Yes, and another fellow critic points out David Frost wasn't Richard Nixon's foe so much as that camera's red light, which Ron Howard films as futuristic, robotic, and destructive from Nixon's vantage point. Which is actually the title of a movie that I did in the original video. Anyway, what audiences deduce from one shot can imprint how an entire era is interpreted. And another fellow critic said, Howard is such a gifted filmmaker who makes it all seem effortless, easily coaxing two equally superb performances from Langella and Sheen. Frost Nixon is a first class achievement. Another fellow critic said, Howard can't, as someone mentions in the film, distinguish between a performer and a journalist. I th arguably true, yes. Another fellow film, bleh, fellow film critic, clearly the work of a mature filmmaker, one with the patience and self-confidence to make a smart film whose success is largely in the hands of its talented cast. And another fellow critic said, the director of Apollo 13 and of your mind serves a a merely pleasing, vaguely edifying tale of penitence and redemption, or something like that. I wouldn't go that far. Another film critic said, Howard is a pretty boring director who knows how to put together a film and tell a story, but they're rarely anything more than mediocre. Hmm. I wouldn't go quite that far, but he's, he's not completely off. And another film critic said, told in a quasi-documentary style with a supporting cast, Reminisce about their experiences, the camera, while also appearing in the dramatization, enables director Ron Howard to heighten the emotion and the sense that Frost is walking himself into not just losing a small fortune, but also ruining his career. One fellow critic said, Ron Howard has the benefit of being able to structure the film's entire second act around close-ups, which allows his two fine leading actors to convey the smallest details of emotional turmoil. Very true. That's... Some of the best of the film is the the last interview of which is uses a lot of close ups and focuses very much on the two of them. Risk and intense with Howard and company rising to the challenge of recreating an infamous nineteen seventy seven television interview. David Frost scored with disgraced former US President Richard Nixon. The stage play turned big screen Oscar contender zips along from scene to scene with rare pep, until building to a furious climax. And remember, this isn't a movie about alien invasions or pirate ghosts, it's a movie about two guys talking. The two hour plus running time zooms by as the so-called thinking man's Rocky plays like an intellectual boxing match with Nixon effortlessly dodging Frost's hesitant jabs and then with Challenger looking like he won't last the distance. Howard keeps the pace brisk, light when it needs to be, heavy when it's called for. Along with Langella, he turns Frost Nixon into one of the most entertaining history lessons imaginable. And... Right, and a Rotten Tomatoes user said that Nixon vs. Frost isn't my favorite versus movie. I like Freddy vs. Jason and Batman v Superman better. I was looking forward to Jones v. Bond, but Connery died Saturday already. And I did a trivia note that before Ron Howard was selected to direct this film, there was strong competition from other filmmakers, including Martin Scorsese, Mike Nichols, George Clooney, Sam Mendes, and Bennett Miller. Yeah, I, I can't deny, Martin Scorsese, as much as I love the movie, in Martin Scorsese's hands, it would have been even better. I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with Mike Nichols or Bennett Miller. I think George Clooney would have done a, a really good job, possibly slightly better, and Sam Mendes would also have done an incredible job. Now, the the very first shot of the movie is a TV screen comes on and shows coverage of Watergate, which right away tells us that this is about the TV presentation of Nixon's <sighs> fatal... Uh, Fatal flaw, fatal mistake, final, you know, the, the nail in the coffin. And, yeah, the, the opening, as, as the opening plays out, we see the last moments of Nixon's presidency, and we hear recordings of the real Nixon smoothing us, you know, and, and yeah, smoothing us into how it's about him, 
And then we see and hear of Langella as an excellent, so that we accept him as an excellent. Now, the I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it definitely fits what came before. I'm very happy with how the movie ends. There's arguably at least one Deus Ex Machina. Arguably some other convenient writing. The ending is a very strong release of the tension that's been built up over the interviews and the rest of the film. And the movie does not lose your interest along the way. Now, I'll admit I don't have a lot of history with watching stage plays, but I definitely can't see how this story worked well on stage. So it's good that this film doesn't feel like they just filmed a stage play. The movie makes takes advantage of things that movies can do that, that a stage play simply can't. Camera angles, editing, freedom of movement. So, you know, I myself haven't watched the play, so I don't know what was changed, but you're in luck. There's an excellent IMDb user review comparing them. The one-line summary is, Howard does not disgrace himself, and the play works better as a film by Chris Kinnick. Now, the... I would say the cast very much understood their respective roles. Frank Langella plays Richard Nixon. He gives an excellent performance. While I, of course, also love Anthony Hopkins' performance as Nixon in Oliver Stone's Nixon, that one is a bit heavy on ticks and body language, where Frank Langella's performance in this is a bit more subdued. Now, he's introduced giving the resignation speech, so immediately we think of him as having less power than he once had. And he does a great job at delivering these interminably, criminally long monologues about his time as president in a way that's clearly boring for other characters but not actually boring for us, the audience. It is not easy to bore characters without boring the audience. And I'm going to quote from a fellow critic. Unlike the gargoyle I remember, Langella's Nixon exudes a seductive charm and vulnerability. He's the film's chief virtue and its biggest flaw. While the main character is Michael Sheen's David Frost, Frank Langella is fascinating as the cold and withdrawn Richard Nixon. Once the interviews themselves get underway, Frost Nixon at last begins to involve us and the two actors do their best work. See, I wouldn't quite... I felt involved from the very start. Anyway, Langella doesn't quite nail Nixon's voice, more like John Huston's, but he gets those sudden shifts of temper just right. Here's the angry, paranoid, self-pitying, and rather sinister fellow one hears on those famous White House tapes an operator with a small supply of charm and an unlimited interest in money. When Nixon meets Frost's girlfriend Caroline, Rebecca Hall, woefully underneath, he advises Frost to marry her, mainly because she's a resident of Monaco. They pay no taxes there. And Michael Sheen plays David Frost. The introduction to him focuses on how superficial his current TV show is and that he's all about controlling his appearance on TV. And, you know, literally, the very first thing we see, you know, like, an, an assistant holds up a mirror. And he, you know, checks his face in the mirror right before he walks out, you know. And, obviously, that's not... That's, plenty of people do that before, right before they get on camera. They, they make sure what they look like. But it's the very first thing we see. In fact, before we see his face, we see a little of it reflected in that mirror. So, immediately, we think of... This is a guy who's very much about appearances. He's, it is important to him that his appearance is, will, will be positively received. And I have to admit, a lot of the stuff that I've... I guess it's not even that I've seen the entire movie. I've just seen clips. I've seen clips of him in movies where he did not care about the movie he was in. Like the, the Twilight movies, for example, and his performance is ridiculously over the top. So, you know, obviously I'm not surprised that he doesn't do that here, but it is, it is nice to see that he can be a much more, just like, give a, give a good performance. Instead of, 
as, as much fun as it is to watch him ham it, just ham it up, this movie would not have been able to survive that kind of thing. And Rebecca Hall as Carolyn Cushing. Now, I'm going to briefly quote IMDb trivia. Whereas in the film, she, she seems just to be a jet-setting socialite, Cushing was actually a journalist, and accompanied accompany Frost as much in this capacity as, as his girlfriend. And even the very introduction to her character has the camera focus on that she's attractive. Like, the, the immediately, you know, Frost feels himself drawn to her, and it's the, the you know, it's, it's in part because she's attractive and in part because he has a really great opening line. She, you know, she's off, they're, they're on this, you know, they're on first class in this plane, and she's offered champagne and turns it down. So he walks up and says, you don't like champagne, which, you know, that's, that's a good opener. That's a, yeah. The very first thing she says about Nixon to David is, they say he has the biggest head, but the sexiest voice. She brings food for the journalist team. She reads aloud a positive newspaper article. She tries to raise David's spirits when he's feeling like he's not doing well enough with, while the, you know, the, the journalists, yeah. The other journalists criticize him, you know, what would be considered by many to be chick stuff. It's really frustrating how she's treated so shallowly by the movie. They could very easily have had her be very clearly part of the journalistic team. You know, I mean, a lot of it is like montage of the, the actors like looking really determined and like underlining text and, and like looking really closely at, at, you know, something they're reading and, you know, what one of them will say, wait, what, what were you saying about that? And then one of the others will say what the, she could very easily, very smoothly have fit in there. This is not one of those movies where you can't really see how they would have, yeah. And I honestly can't help but think that it's because one or more of the men making this movie either were personally threatened by the idea of a strong woman or thought that audiences would be, and both of those are very sad to think about. And quoting a fellow critic, a few rankling details in this movie about two men and their male advisors, I wince at the inclusion of, and he put this in, uh, he, he capitalized, the, yeah, you know, capital T, the capital G girlfriend, a character whose frail narrative purpose is to demonstrate Frost's charm but it mostly just wanders around looking pretty. That's an excellent way to put it. Rebecca Hall, superb in Woody Allen's Vicky Cristina Barcelona, criminally underused here in insultingly paper-thin role of Frost's hot mistress. Rebecca Hall is beautiful and so different from her recent neurotic role in Vicky Cristina Barcelona that she's almost unrecognizable, which is usually the mark of a good actor. And that's true. She is completely... Like, I... I watched this movie and that one some some time apart so the first time that i watched i'm pretty sure i watched yeah i watched vicky christina barcelona before i watched frost nixon the first time i watched frost nixon i didn't realize that was her until i saw her in the cast list the she she's so completely different and that's you know woody allen loves to write and direct neurotic characters so that's not a, it's not a stretch for him but, you know, I don't, I don't know if in real life she's really, like, charming and, and just, you know, yeah, a approachable. Like, she isn't this, or she's actually neurotic, or something else entirely. But in at least one of these, she's definitely acting. She's, being, she's performing a role that's very different from what she's like in real life. And she completely disappears into the role. Toby Jones play Irving Swifty Lazar. I don't have a lot to add. I think it was Lindsay Ellis who said that Stanley Tucci should be in every movie ever made. I forget who it was that added that so should Toby Jones, but I would just like to... Yes, I agree. They, they both... They, they make every movie they're in better. And 
Sam Rockwell plays James Reston Jr. And the... Um, actually, yes, right. I was going to... Right. Matthew McFadden plays John Burke, Oliver Platt as Bob Zelnick. The, the, they make up David Frost's journalistic team, and they confront him when they don't think he's hitting Nixon hard enough. It's a great source of tension. The Some people feel that the movie spells out too many things. I do think that when... I, I, you know, sometimes it'll cut to them, you know, in the actual interview and we'll hear what they're saying, but, you know, Frost can't. And sometimes it'll be between interviews, they'll confront him about it, and, yeah, they do a really good job pointing out the, the you know, the places where he lets Nixon talk for entirely too long. And Clint Howard's in the movie, I really... I feel bad for Clint Howard whenever Ron Howard doesn't find a way to put him in one of his movies. I mean, he's talented too, you know, a lot, a lot of, you know, I, I guess he he's not quote-unquote pretty enough for, for lead roles, but Clint Howard's very talented. And and has, wasn't he like a kid when he was on Star Trek, the original series? He gave, I remember him giving a good performance there. Not, not a lot of good kid actors. And actually, yeah, I think Ron Howard... Didn't he also start acting when he was a kid? I'm, I'm not expecting you to answer me. I know this is one-way communication. I'm just thinking out loud. Now, let's see. That is... Now, that's right. I've seen Michael Sheen in some of, yeah, yeah the first three Underworld movies. Now, let's see. right, and and Rebecca Hall, of course, also in the Prestige, Iron Man three, and the Town. Yeah, she's she's tremendously talented, very convincing in all of these movies. And so. The, yeah, so the two leads are the same. I can get behind getting them to do both versions. They are immensely talented. They had the material so committed to memory that they only flubbed once each. And Sheen is an absolute chameleon, disappearing entirely into what he portrays. So, you know, I, I can just barely believe that he played Lucian in the Underworld trilogy. He, he was great in those, but he's hugely different. Yeah. The cast is fantastic, and everyone really delves into their credible and swiftly developed characters. This manages to, manages to not paint anyone as a one-note good or bad guy. And I have to admit, I did not feel any sympathy for the former president before this film. The acting is amazing. Now, quoting fellow critic, Most interviews are contests of a kind, but Morgan tur turns Frost's Nixon interviews into a battle for survival. It doesn't matter whether this is historically accurate or not, M Morgan creates the drama, and through the drama, we engage with the broader facts. In a similar way, in order to em emphasize the contrast between Frost and Nixon, and to highlight the improbability of Frost being the one to land his interviews, Morgan portrays Frost as an airy playboy, the person least likely to interview a crafty politician and get something important out of him. In fact, in 1977, Frost's reputation in the United States was that of a serious penetrating interview. In a viewer, though not a political journalist by any means, neither was he Johnny Carson or Richard Hogan. Frost's intellectual doggedness, his ego enlistment in being just the man to get at the truth, made it clear to everyone going in that Nixon would have to be on his toes. But Morgan would have it believed that Frost went in like David versus Goliath. Again, that's all for the best. The mild distortion serves Morgan's dramatic purpose and also allows him to underline some true contrasts in Frost and Nixon's natures. Frost was and is a bon vivant, Nixon a loner. Frost was a ladies' man while Nixon married the first woman who was nice to him. Frost liked people and was liked by them. Nixon never fit in. Born both from modest means, Frost cultivated a taste for luxury while Nixon's habit, habits remained austere. Now, the... Yeah, we, we definitely empathize with the protagonists. And really, at times, also, Nixon, the antagonist. And that was the idea, and I think that was the right way. 
this could easily have painted Nixon far worse than it did, and the I'm sure the temptation was there, and I'm I appreciate that. As much as they could, as much as they did, they did fight the temptation. Now, let's see. yeah, I would say that everyone is well cast for the role, especially both leads. They're absolutely perfect, and the movie would not work if they weren't. Now, for the dialogue, some of the time, Characters in this do talk the way that people do in real life. Now, yeah, the, the dialogue is excellent. A little of it was improvised, which really shows that they understood their characters. And some of the characters we s are, are shown in tremendously varied circumstances. So we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong, etc. Now, yeah, so I think the follow, yeah, I, the following is a spoiler. So, spoiler for the movie until you see me roll my index finger. If there's one thing that stays with you long after watching this movie, well, there, there might be others as well, but one thing that really sticks with me is the loneliness that Nixon feels, at least according to this movie, and yeah. No more spoilers for the time being. Now, the cinematography was done by Salvatore Tocchino, and I have to admit, I haven't seen much of it. He, he also DP'd Spider-Man Homecoming, but that's, that's it. I'm pretty sure there isn't handheld, there, there is some, some Steadicam shots. I think handheld would have been excessive. But yeah, the the I, I forget exactly where, if it's the let's see, right. Most of the camera work was improvised and helped make it feel dynamic and natural. I forget exactly where I learned this, but the they were always running two cameras, and that enabled the yeah. Thus enabling the the once improvised camera work. And this was edited by Daniel P. Hanley and Mike Hill. And let's see, yes, certainly Daniel edited actually, yeah, he, he edited every single of the he's he's edited every single Ron Howard movie that I've watched. And he also edited Problem Child. So yeah, he he does a really good job. Let's see. So the following is not something I agree with, but it is at least a little funny. Quoting a fellow critic here: Sometimes I worry that Ron Howard actually listens to every dumb eighteen-year-old drunk kid who tells him how to edit his movies. You know. Ridley Scott actually did that for Legend, and apparently the movie would be much better if not, so that really sucks. Its boxing metaphor plays out in such mind-numbingly literal terms, there might as well have been a woman in a bikini announcing the beginning of each day's interview. Kind of, yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah. Quoting fellow critic here, Frost Nixon makes use of a device remembered from such films as Warren Beatty's Threads, in which key associates of the subject matter will intermittently recount commentary about the events that are unfolding on screen. In this case, there are the same actors in the film, whereas in Reds, they were the real people. Though an unusual form of organization and narration, in Frost Nixon, it's largely unnecessary and less convincing. The use of this for storytelling purposes causes the film to have a pseudo-documentary feel, which slows things down while boosting realism for the setting. Fortunately, the screenplay is so quick and compelling that it's more of a white knuckle thriller than a governmental melodrama. On the DVD commentary, Ron Howard explains that the stage play had fourth wall breaks. The, the actors would literally look out into the audience and 
speak directly to the audience and, and you know in, in a sort of internal narration you know they, they were yeah thinking out loud for the purposes of but we were hearing their thoughts and I can understand why he felt that he couldn't just completely do away with it and obviously actually like he, he had so he had to bring in some kind of format that would work for you know this is not the kind of movie where you can get away with just having characters like go from being in the scene to just looking directly into the camera lens and talk and you know for some movies that works incredibly well you know Deadpool Wolf of Wall Street but for this it would not work any ch and yeah quoting a fellow creative game here any time a scene had the slightest amount of nuance or subtext how it cuts to a fake interview of a character explaining what that nuance or subtext was like he doesn't trust us to pick up on it otherwise it makes me feel like Howard is talking down to me. Now, the research and journalism montages are quite well edited. And again, it's the kind of thing where you, you know, you have to get across with that kind of montage that these people are spending a lot of time diving deep into this stuff without us, the audience, feeling as exhausted as they do while doing it. Now, Quoting fellow critic here, there is a surprisingly gothic feel to the filmmaking. Hans Zimmer's music is brooding and solemn. The cinematography is very dark. At one stage, we may see Hugh Hefner and some Playboy bunnies in the distance, but Hefner's brand of hedonism is little in evidence here. Earlier in his career, Frank Langella played Dracula. There is a hint of Bela Lugosi about him as he welcomes Frost and his team into his sepulchre like office with all its old photographs of Brezhnev and other foreign men. Now, let's see. The, right, so there are not actually very many special effects in this movie. I was actually a little surprised that there were any, but there's actually there's a little bit of CGI and other digital effects. If you don't know where those are, you can't tell. And they were done completely out of necessity. The, they simply wouldn't have been able to afford doing in real life the things that they instead, you know, digitally, yeah. Now, the budget was $25 million, and it's, yeah, you know, the, the it, it doesn't look like a cheap movie, and it also doesn't look like they spent much more on it than that. The production design is very authentic. They recreate the 70s, a decade that apparently, in, in one of the DVD special features, the actor known as Sam Rockwell says that he feels very at home in in movies and yeah he's he's good in movies that are set in the 70s now this was actually filmed you know so, some of the, the filming actually was in the the nixon the the yeah nixon san clemente compound and nixon library now, the costume department dressed Nixon staff in very conservative dress and used earthy colors for the Frost team. All of Nixon's suits are different shades of navy blue because he wore a lot of navy blue, and all of his ties have diamond shapes on them because he was wearing a tie with diamond shapes on during the resignation speech. And the DP expressed that he felt it helped his work that the, the costume department did that. Now. Yeah, Nixon makes makes a very memorable antagonist, and Frost is um, a memorable and very charismatic protagonist. Now, the scenes are easy to follow. They're meant to be, and I think that was the right choice. So, let's 
Let's see. The music was done by Hans Zimmer. Let's see. And the yeah, on the commentary, Ron, Ron Howard says that Hans was originally expecting to make ten or twenty minutes of music, but you know they were expecting the rest to be songs from the period, but ended up having to make around thirty-five or forty minutes and. You know, if I recall, he said that he felt a certain amount of pressure that, you know, having to do so much more than he expected, you know, that's upwards of twice as much as he expected or more. And I, I think it did help his, you know, it made it even better than, yeah. You know, so sometimes the, the best creative work comes out of limitations and constraints. Now, the there is some blue and black comedy and sometimes we laugh with characters, sometimes at them. As far as violence and gore, there we, we see some brief war footage from Vietnam. There is very little and only very brief sexual material and there is a little bit of swearing but some of it is very strongly, you know, I mean, if you depict Nixon, you, you're going to have to, that's, that's, that's how he talked, you know, it's, it's literally, we, we literally have that on tape. Now, I don't think any of this supposed object, objectionable material, that there's too much of it, it's mostly appropriate, it mostly serves the purpose. Now, the level of realism is high. Now, on pacing, quoting a fellow critic, director Ron Howard, fully aware of the piece's theatrical roots, builds the tension between the two men very tightly and keeps it from flagging, at times approaching the pacing of the cuts, almost like a boxing match. The first hour becomes almost entirely exposition. Information is repeated, scenes recapitulate one another, battle plans are drawn and redrawn. No hold barred, says Nixon of the coming bout, no fewer than four times. At one point, a title card indicates on screen, 55 days before the interview. And you can't help groaning, for heaven's sake, how much fanfare does a TV show need? I don't, I, I think it just works. I, I didn't think it was bad at all, but that was so funny that I had to bring attention to it. Now, the movie is an hour, 51, uh, 52 minutes long without end credits and an hour and 57 minutes long with them it is worth that amount as investment of time if you're not interested in, in in the rest of the movie once you've watched the first maybe 30 minutes or so the movie probably isn't your kind of thing I th some people feel like it's much longer than it actually is I don't think that it feels longer or shorter than it is Now, yeah, so as I've already hinted at, I'm, I'm going to flat out say conservatives who have any respect for Nixon probably won't like this movie. Now, and at times it can definitely get very preachy about its politics. Now... The best element of this movie is the the final interview. There there are a couple of bits of that that are just absolutely incredible, and really the entire final interview. I I would say it's well worth the wait. You know, uh, yeah. And I personally would recommend owning this. You know, it's it's a movie you can watch over and over and. You know, if, if you have friends who want to, you know, you, you can show you can show one or two scenes and people will still really get a kick out of it. The worst aspect of the movie is probably the stuff that is not accurate to what really happened. The, and, you know, if you go into the movie knowing 
about that and you know lower your expectations for that aspect for the accuracy to real life aspect it'll be frust less <laughs> Freudian slip it'll be less frustrating it will still be frustrating but less so and quoting a fellow critic history is made by the people who write it not the people who actually do the deeds and this film is a prime example he gave it a 5 out of 10 Despite a moving, canny incarnation of the man by Frank Langella, despite a slickly entertaining coffee table production as only Ron Howard knows how, the film, the, the movie feels cooked up. In the name of dramatizing history, Frost Nixon sacrifices it. About 50% of the film is recreated material from the years, often shifted shape and edited to increase the drama. Obviously, a great deal had to be caught cut since the broadcast versions of the interviews spanned six hours with many additional hours of footage not shown, and Howard wisely concentrates on the segments that are remembered and or made history. For a while, the interviews represent a duel of wits between Nixon and Frost, with the older, more experienced man continually ga gaining the upper hand and deflecting every thrust, no matter how expertly played, that Frost could provide. Let's see. And... Yeah, also, the worst aspect, according to others, is also the stuff that isn't accurate to what really happened. And a number of people said that Howard's style is very bland, and that, that really hurts your experience of watching the movie. I can't really argue that his, his style is pretty bland. I don't think it's a big problem. Now, I was most worried that it would get boring, since so much of it is people talking about things that have happened in the past. Like, it's not even that they're... Uh, the interviews themselves. It, it is people... Like, this this stuff could have consequences, but a lot of the time it's people talking about stuff that's already happened that they can't go back and do anything about. But the movie exceeded my expectations, and I was most looking forward to the tension that, you know, Nixon was never one to eagerly admit defeat. And the movie exceeded my expectations. And yeah, so recently I've been talking about does the movie leave you Yeah, so briefly, it's the movie's entertaining to watch and it is also a good movie and not only in parts but as a whole. Now, as far as, you know, does it maybe leave you in a negative state of mind? Spoiler for this movie. If you don't like Nixon, you'll leave the movie relieved. If you do like him, you might leave it feeling defeated. No more spoilers for the time being. Now, the trailers give away too much. Really, actually, I've only been able to find one trailer you know, on, on YouTube, here on YouTube, there's one that's two and a half minutes and one that's two minutes and 47 seconds. They're the same. Just, there's like, there's some space at the start and end of the two minutes 47 one, but the content. But the, you know, the trailer does give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you like the movie. The cover and or poster do not give away too much, and they do give you a pretty decent idea of what the movie is like if you yeah if you like the cover and the poster you like the movie and if not you don't perhaps i can't say that certainly the movie doesn't have a lot of metaphors and it's not really difficult to understand but you definitely do need to know about nixon and the parts of u.s history when he had political power it's not a movie you need to watch more than once to fully understand but yeah, you know, the movie's not going to hold your hand. You you really do need to know. The, the only thing I didn't already know before, you know, I probably had heard about the Frost Nixon interviews before watching this, but I knew almost nothing about David Frost himself other than that, you know. And, and him, you don't need to know very much about. I mean, it's a movie made by Americans, for Americans, about an American president. And this guy, I guess he's like British, he's got an accent. I, I don't know. I, we, we're going to have to explain who he is for, for the Americans. 
Now, even if you're not a political junkie, you might be surprised by how gripping it is to watch two men sit and talk. Now, the movie is better than you might expect it to be. But it's not, you know, if, if you listen to the critics, it's been, it's been quite well received. It, yeah, quite well received. And seeing Nixon confronted, parts of that arguably qualifies as emotional porn. Now, let's see. When I searched on YouTube videos about this movie, I found quite a lot. Some of them were not related to the movie, but were just about Nixon. The tomato meter, the critics gave this 93 out of 100, and the users 88 out of 100. And the last user we used seemed to be from the 23rd of February of this year. At least last I checked. It wasn't, it wasn't today, so even more recent. There are 258 Rotten Tomatoes critic reviews, so if that's, yeah, there's there's a bit to sit and read if that's something you're... Now, the critics' consensus is Frost Nixon is witty and eloquent cross between a boxing match and a ballet with Oscar-worthy performances. And, yeah, that's well put. The, on, Meta, on Metacritic, the critics gave this 80 out of 100 and the users 7.8 out of 10. And the last user reviews I saw were from the 30th of January this year. And on IMDb it has a 7.7. 7. And so, so yeah, the MPA age rating is an R for a short scene of disturbing content. I think we can start strongly on which you the nudity. Now, I recommend this to anyone who cares about holding people like Nixon accountable. And the DVD you know, it comes with an inform informational commentary track by Howard, a well done 23 minute behind the scenes production, 22 and a half minutes of deleted scenes, which are pretty good. And some of some of them, it's basically like you see the entire scene where in in the final movie they they trimmed parts of it. You know, yeah, and two well made directs of seven and a half minutes about the real interview and six minutes about the Nixon Library respectively. And yeah, I give this seven unburnt tapes out of ten. And that is the end of the review itself. Which brings us into the spoiler ridden section sections thoughts. Starting with the First thought section disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice to read the description box. I often try to swap through your pants during disclaimers since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, once again, spoilers on, you know, for the entire rest of the video, I will not be warning before I spoil anything in this movie or the stage play. I will warn verbally and hold up an index finger if I spoil anything other than this movie and its stage play. So, let's see. Yeah, content warning, error trigger warning for gaslighting. Now, I might swear at least a little in this video. If you know, once again, it's it you can't quote Nixon for very long without swearing. Now, instead of me quoting all the lines that I love from this movie, let me just say here I love every line that they put in the end of the quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting there quoting all of them. Now, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts, some analysis, some MCPA riff tracks, and other jokes, especially jokes in the first section. 
time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is stuff that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary like tweeting or like. The section after that is stuff that I had before watching. And the final section, I get stuff I think we're filing into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, and and Wikipedia. Now that I think the the movie does have empathy even for the least likable characters, and I appreciate that. Even like some some of them you don't see very much, but like even what was his name again? Jack Brennan, I think the, the you know uh, Kevin Bacon's character. Like for for a lot of his performance, he comes off as just really hostile and angry and bitter towards Frost and his team. But when he, you know, when when he stops the in, the final interview, and and talks to Nixon and says, I think if you're going to make some kind of emotional, you know, maybe we should. I don't think he's a strategize, but we should we should plan it out or that kind of thing. Like you can very clearly tell he legitimately does care about Nixon. He wants to preserve the man's legacy and he doesn't want him to say something that he'll end up regretting. And he doesn't approach it in like a you know, parental looking down kind of way. He he clearly has a lot of respect. I think the movie does a pretty good job. Like, there are several times where the movie kind of underlines Nixon's, you know, for example, the, like, when, when, you know, when, when he hears that David Frost almost married Diane Carroll, he's like, but isn't she black? Like, you know, the, the, his, his, yeah, the, you know, the, the hatred he had towards certain groups of people. You know, when, when he says that, you know, it'll be funny for the, the, ah, what's it called? The two people working on his biography, I think it is, It'll be funny for them to shake hands with Swifty Lazar and then see him, you know, wipe off his hand with a, a tissue because he's, what was he said, Hy hygiene obsessive or something like that. You know, the movie could easily have done that way more frequently than it does, and I appreciate their restraint. That brings us to... The second section, the second thoughts section. Notes taken while watching. Hugely different introductions to Nixon and Frost, immediately setting up how different they are, how, you know, their respective, you know, that's both of them, the first time we see them is right before they get on camera. And with Nixon, there's this clear. Like, you know, he he doesn't like. Yeah, he he's not he's not really comfortable on camera, and with Frost, he's he's clearly extremely comfortable being on camera, and also we see that Nixon is in this, you know, the the what's it called? You know, he's he's resigning, so he's he's in a really bad place, whereas Frost, you know, we 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 are told that. This is, you know, he. This is not the show he wished he was making, but this is still something that you know you can tell that he is. He likes what he's doing. Basically, he he wishes it was more, but it's it's not. It's, yeah. And Frost notices Nixon's face reveals resignation, right before he enters the helicopter, and also. After he's he's in the helicopter, you can see through the window, and that kind of immediately, you know, he's like, he's he's. There's there's probably this sort of right right there. He he wonders, could I get him to confess? You know, if if he feels like he's, 
you know, he, he can tell that, that Nixon does not like how things were, you know, N Nixon says at, at one point in, in the film that, you know, you would have thought that he was relieved now that he can't be prosecuted, but he, you know, we don't know if that's completely true or not, but he claims that he wishes he could have kept fighting. Come on, John, we've done political interviews before in the AR booth. And Frost is doing a show about an escape artist. There's a huge leap between that and then the Nixon interviews. Now, let's see. And yeah, you know, on, on the on the plane when you know Frost and, and Caroline start talking, you know, he I forget exactly where it is. He he talks about some some place, and she says she's never been there, and he says you'd love it. It's like Paris without the French. Now I always say that the British people are one hundred percent entitled to hate the French. You know, a hundred years of war. I th I think you earned the right. If you're an American and you hate the French, you better have a different reason than oh you know. De Gaulle made it sound like he was the one who freed the French, when really the Americans went in and bombed a lot of French buildings, completely destroying when they could have just waited out for the German troops to run out of food and ammunition, but, uh, you know, they wanted to do it really quickly. It was kind of, you know, maybe it was a follow-up kind of thing, I don't know, but that's just not, and, and, ah, oh, then they won't go into Iraq when you have no proof of weapons of mass destruction, you know, but that's, yeah. Americans do not like when people point out their lies. I've spent enough time with Americans to know that that is not all Americans. Hashtag not all Americans, but some Americans, it is the worst thing you can do to, in, in their view, is, is not buy the lies that, maybe especially if those lies come from the government and or military. I would never want to be a Russian. They never know when they're being typed. Frost and we, the audience, wonder if he was intentionally making a self-deprecating joke, or if he's just clueless. So that meeting just cost him 200000 If I had known that, I would have offered him tea. I think we have a new most expensive cup you'll ever drink from. I think the previous record was held by... What's his name again? The guy who lives like a capitalist every single day? Day? Charlie Kirk, right? I th no, wait, no, it's... No, wait, no, Crowder, Stephen Crowder. Yeah. If... I'm, I'm not the only one who occasionally gets these conservative chuckleheads mixed up. I like the first conversation between Frost and... What does that say? What? Reston, yeah, Reston Jr. Frost legitimately seems to think it would be enough just to get the interview, and Reston demands a trial. Good use of camera work and editing to get across the orthodontic society being incredibly bored and legitimately awkward at Nixon's speech. And like I said in the review, like, clear, like, you know, you can understand from how he's talking how people would be bored listening to him, but we, the audience, aren't, like, Losing interest. The conversation on the phone between Jack and David is really great. Really gets across both of them, you know, their both the nervousness felt by the Nixon people about how bad Nixon might end up looking, and that David is no pushover and is determined to get Nixon on the record. And yeah, the bit with drone on and and when he, you know. Jack is like, you you know, full well that, you know, what was it, 30% of what he did was 100% legal, and 60%, okay, he broke the law, but you know what, he thought he was doing the right thing, and then Frost cuts in with, yes, but that still leaves 10% where he did the wrong thing knowingly and for his own, you know, for his own purposes. Oh, that's right, yeah, sorry, he didn't say, he didn't know he was doing, that what he was doing was wrong, he, he thought that it was in the interest of the country. Where are you at this moment, psychically? 
psychically, what's that supposed to mean? Like Professor X, Dark Phoenix, that kind of thing? How much did, did this cost? Nixon playing mind games. And so yeah, the first of the four interviews starts 52 minutes in. So like there's an hour of movie left. You know, we're, we're more than, wait, yeah, roughly ha halfway through. I can understand people who think that, you know, way too much of the movie is devoted to prep. Great job with editing and acting to really milk the tension when David opens with the question about burning the tapes. That was about the most emotional moment, yes. Here we go. Except... It's hard to say what's the most emotional moment. And you lost them. Yeah, I know, I know. My Nixon impersonation definitely needs work. Maybe I need to take quote, take, take some notes from uh, Oliver. Wait, Oliver? Yeah, needs, I, I think you know him. Crap, I don't remember. I remember neither actor name or character. I, th I think it's Oliver Platt, but yeah. When, you know, the, the one who talks about how Kennedy screwed everything and anything, including checkers. And right after they cut taping on the first interview, Nixon's just toying with David. Did you do any fornicating? Oh, fornicate off! That parody song that plays at David's birthday is pretty good. I forget if they wrote it for this movie or if that was actually something from back then, but... Yeah, you know, the, the Frost and Nixon, Frost and Nixon goes together like Mason Dixon and... Yeah. Steak or fish? Lasagna. An hour and 17 minutes in and Nixon calls David before the final interview. So the final interview gets a lot more screen time than the first three since it's the one that David wins. And it's the... It's, yeah, they, they basically treat it like as long as he at least wins that one, then it's, you know the rest of it is... yeah. I'm going to give it my best shot. No holds barred. And no bars held. Caroline brings him the food for King, for which he paid Damani's. And David's like, I've got to work, which clearly the movie thinks a woman wouldn't know anything about. Huh. I forget where I put it, so I'll just, I'll say it here, because now I'm worried that I might have accidentally missed it. But yeah, the, the... You know, the, the actress who plays Pat Nixon doesn't get to do very much in this movie, but when the... I th yeah, yeah, before the first interview, she walks up to Nixon and hands him a handkerchief, and they briefly kiss. It's a, it's a very dem demure kiss. And when, right, you know, before they start the interview, he says, you don't mind this handkerchief, right? Because I need to wipe off sweat from the upper lip. So, you know, she was like... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very stereotypical kind of old-fashioned, you know, the wife brings the husband something he really couldn't do without kind of thing, but it's sweet. I quite like, you know, it's, I, I think it's right after the last interview starts up. We get this shot of, like, Dave, you know, we, we see David's, like, thing of notes, and it's got all this, like, he underlined words and he drew, like, arrows between different parts. And it's like, of course that's how it's going to look after they do this intense bit of work near the end. Which, the, the yeah, in, in reality, as apparently they didn't do that. But that, you know, it works well for movies. The, the thing with the, you know, the phone call didn't take place. And, you know, oh, quickly get these records from the, you know, anyway. Yeah, of course it's going to look like that after they do that intense bit of work near the end, but it is much more difficult for him to get into than if it was just, you know, one line, non line, it's, yeah. The final interview gets underway, and Fro Frost is not allowing Nixon to just go off like he has been. Go and ask. A conversation with Coulson, and you can clearly see that Nixon's like, I'm worried! The final interview it really is deeply compelling. Nixon tries to dodge and weave, and 
Davy just keeps hitting him. Quite like the camera following Frost as he walks away from like, I, I forget which of it, one of his colleagues is like, okay, you know, just keep going, just keep going, just follow up on that last thing you said, just, you know, he really, yeah, that is very, he, he really is, like, he, he might as well be of, uh, what, what are those called again? Boxing coach? I, I don't know, I don't know much about sports, but he, he really does sound like a, a boxing coach standing there, okay, you, you got him good, just keep hitting, hitting, okay, just, you know, but the camera, like, it follows Frost as he walks past that guy, and he, like, he hears it, but he doesn't really respond all the way over, and then he sits down in the chair, and he's ready, and he's clearly determined. It just wouldn't have worked well, wouldn't, wouldn't have had the same effect if there was a cut in there. And David plops the notes onto the floor, so now, you know, he means business. I will grant the scene of Nixon confessing is perhaps pushed at least a little bit too far. It's, you know, it's, it's fanfic by people who can't stand Nixon, basically. Uh, is this what you call a, a dachshund? It's actually a wiener dog. Wiener dog, looking for adventure and a place to rest her head. I do appreciate that the movie doesn't just end on Nixon looking defeated at the end of the interview. Instead of closing on the bit there at the end with the shoes, I suppose it's not that much better, but it's at least a little bit better. Yeah, it does kind of feel like the ending tries to really twist the blade in Nixon. You know, the, the bit with, oh, you know, he never escaped controversy and for the rest of his life everyone thought about him and Watergate you know and yeah I'm just brief spoiler for the very end of Oliver Stone's Nixon comparatively you know that movie points out several other presidents did still consult with him up until oh wait was it several presidents showed up at his funeral at least one other president consulted with him up until his death so yeah and it's not like I, I really, uh, actually, yeah, no more spoilers for Oliver Stone's Nixon. I really don't get the sense that Oliver Stone likes Richard Nixon, you know, but he does have more respect for him than a number of the people making this movie. Now, that brings us to the very next section. Entitled... Notes taken before watching. This is going much quicker than some of the other recent ones, which is good because I've been taking too long this movie. So, yeah, Wikipedia has an, an entire section. The, the Wikipedia entry for this movie has a section simply called Dramatic License and Factual Inaccuracies. And I am going to briefly go into some, let's see, so, yeah, you know, basically the, the phone call didn't take place during the, the period of the interviews, but during the Watergate scandal, Nixon would sometimes make midnight phone calls that he couldn't very well recall the following day. So, Essentially, for those who know, that it's not something that happened in real life during the Frost Nixon interviews. This change implies that Nixon was as anxious about these interviews during them as he was about Watergate during that. And that's, you know, that's a perfectly decent kind of, yeah, I, I don't think that's a, a huge problem. Now, the, yeah. One, one inaccuracy noted by Elizabeth Drew of the Huffington Post, author of Richard and Nixon, from 2007. The movie fails to mention the fact that Nixon received 20% of the profits from the interviews. Let's see. So, yeah, that's a very substantial difference. So if you only watch this movie and you don't know that, you might think that this was way more of a victory than it really was. You know, the 20% the thing, omitting that detail makes it sound like Nixon gained less from the interviews than he actually did. And actually, yeah, and another thing that makes the movie seem like more of a victory than it really was, let's see, the critical line in the movie that's particularly deceptive, 
Nixon admitted that he was involved in a cover-up, as you call it. What Nixon actually said was, you're wanting me to say that I participated in an illegal cover-up. No. Now, David Einstein of New York wrote that the film overstates the importance of its basis for us news, stating it elevates the 1977 interviews Nixon gave, or rather sold for an unheard of 600,000 to British TV personality David Frost into a momentous event in the history of politics and media. And yeah, it really, when you when you really look at it, it, it wasn't as big of a deal as the movie makes it seem. And with selective editing, Morgan makes it seem as if Frost got Nixon to admit more than he actually did. Now, let's see. And Caroline said that she remembered Frost as feeling that he did a pretty good, yeah, the real Caroline, feeling he did a pretty good job on every interview, whereas the film depicts him feeling that he did a poor job over the first two interviews, which is a very Hollywood change, make Frost seem like more like an underdog and the last set of interviews more important. Diane Sawyer, portrayed in the film in her role as one of Nixon's researchers, said in December 2008 that Jack Brennan is portrayed as a stern military guy, citing both the play and what she'd heard about the film version, and he's the funniest guy you ever met in your life. An irreverent, wonderful guy, so there you go, it's the movies. Yeah, the movie is not very eager to show people close to Nixon himself as particularly pleasant or happy people, and they probably didn't want to show in a good light a man who may have taken part in making the Vietnam War as monstrous as it was. An early scene of the film set on the southern shore of Sydney Harbor in 1974, with the Sydney Opera House as a backdrop, shows buildings adjacent to the iconic structure which did not exist until 1998, which to be fair would be difficult to change. They'd have to use digital effects or something, and they already have a bunch of those in the film, so yeah. Now, let's see. Right, so I am briefly going to get into some of the, yes, the, the commentary, which only features Ron Howard, the director. The, yeah, he, you know, he felt that it was worth making a movie out of, even though the play was very much written to be a stage play. And he wanted to make the introduction of Nixon somewhat mysterious. He felt that it added a lot to the movie, that they were able to film in the places that some of these things actually took place. And he actually gave Rebecca a larger role than the stage play did. And I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Is that, let's see, is that better or worse? Because it's still a very like traditional gender role thing of like she doesn't really <laughs> yeah I, I'm not 100% certain if that is better or, or not but let's see. and he thought it was important to show the reactions to the interview during the interview and yeah, and, and Nixon saying the president, you know, if the president does it, that means it's not illegal. That was actually in a different interview. But, you know, for, for the stage play, they wrote it into the Watergate part, and so they just left it there for the movie. And he felt it was important to show that Nixon's people respected him. And in the play, you did not see the shoes that... Nixon was given. Ron felt it should be in the movie. And originally he meant for the very last shot of the film to be him, Nixon trying to, to walk in the shoes, but he ended up using instead the one where, like, 
the, sh the box is right there. It, it, actually, yeah, he opens the box and looks at the shoes. The shoes are right there next to him. You know, he could try to put them on. What does he have to lose? But it still just feels... Yeah, it... it he... It, it doesn't... He can't really... What's the word? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I hope I convey what I, I mean to say. I'm not going to keep slowing down this video to... Let's see. But yeah, you know, the, the deleted scenes... We see more of Nixon. Yeah, we see Nixon prepare for the resignation speech. We see more of him giving the resignation speech. Frost doing his show and then watching the resignation speech. You know, it, the the like here in the deleted scenes, we we also see the bit where Frost says Nixon's giving it away too, give, giving the resignation speech way too early in the morning. Half his audience is still asleep, and, you know, it is one of the... I almost feel like they should have just called it extended scenes instead of the... Any, but, yeah, some of it made it into the movie. And I don't really have anything to add about the other special features. I, I want to briefly say the one about the Nixon Library it seems to give a pretty fair view of the library. And... I suppose, yeah, I'll, I'll very briefly, final section, critic sites, MTV, and Wikipedia. So I'm just briefly going to go over and see if I have stuff to... Most of this stuff, most of the stuff I really wanted to get into, I already put in the actual. Actually, yeah, that is everything that I wanted to say. So, if you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching the recording. I'll catch you next time.